All right, I'm going to just ask you to take your Bible and turn to uh, Colossians chapter 2. <clears throat> this morning, I want to share a message called The Power of a Planted Life. The Power of a Planted Life. We're talking about being rooted in Christ. And Colossians chapter 2, I believe it's actually on the screen, says, So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. You know, when Jesus started His public ministry, we read in Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19, that He said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And when Jesus was actually sharing this message in the synagogue in Nazareth, he was quoting in part out of Isaiah chapter 61. And if you continue to read the, the next uh, verses in that chapter, he says, this is the reason why I've come to open blind eyes, set the captives free, to emancipate prisoners. And he says specifically this, that they might be trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. So, I deliver people, I heal people, I save people, so that they can become trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, so that He might be glorified. So it's the perfect desire of our Heavenly Father that we become rooted, we become grounded in His righteousness. And the actual idea when He says that we become trees of righteousness, in the Hebrew language, the word that is translated trees speaks of a very strong tree. And it really literally means an oak tree. And He's saying that we are called to be oaks. We're called to be strong trees. We're not to be tumbleweeds tossed to and fro, blown around by every wind and wave and doctrine and every, every attack of the enemy, not led astray by our emotions, but we can have deep roots so that no matter what adversity we face in life, no matter how intense the circumstances that are, are that come against us, we are standing firmly in Christ and His righteousness, and we know exactly who we are in Him so that we are rooted like this particular oak tree that He speaks of. Now, as Jesus' disciples, here's what He says. Let me read this to you. Luke chapter 6, verse 47, 48 says this. I will show you, Jesus says, what it's like when someone comes to me, listens to my teaching, and then he says this. He said, it's like a person building a house who digs deep and lays the foundation on solid rock. When the floodwaters rise and break against that house, it stands firm because it's well built. Now, notice that Jesus didn't say, if the flood comes, if bad weather occurs, he said, when. When the flood comes, when things become difficult, when adversity attacks, comes against you, what is going to happen? If you are grounded in Christ, then you will stand firm. And this account is actually spoken of twice. The other account is found in Matthew's gospel. But in Luke's gospel, he specifically says that it's like someone who digs deep. So they dig into the rock, they hewn out the rock, and they lay a foundation. And that foundation results in, no matter what's happening in the natural, that they're able to stand when the storms come against. So when we look at the Scripture, there are at least three areas that we as disciples of Jesus are called to be planted in. Three areas that we're called to be rooted in, all right? So we're talking about the power of a planted life. The first area is we're called to be planted in good soil. What do I mean by that? Well, let's look at John chapter 15. There are actually three verses here that we want to look at first of all. Verse number 16, Jesus says, You didn't choose me, I chose you, and I appointed you to go and produce 
lasting fruit. What is lasting fruit? Fruit that literally will abide. Not fruit that's here for one season and gone the next. Then he says in verse 7, um, verse number 8, when you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. And then verse 6, he tells us what happens if we're not bearing fruit. Anyone who does not remain in me, and therefore, if we're not remaining or abiding in him, we will not bear fruit. He says this, is thrown away like a useless branch that withers. So when he talks about remaining or abiding in him, he's saying that the key, this is the key to a life of great fruitfulness, being planted in him. And verse 7 specifically says it's planted in the word of God, planted in truth. Verse 7, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. So you remain in me and my words remain in you. Now remember, Jesus is the word of God, John chapter 1 verse 1. So as we are rooted and grounded in the word of God, which is Jesus as well as the scriptures because there's no distinction then what happens is we're able to stand firm in every situation and circumstance in life. Do you know that there are many voices that are vying for our attention? There are many voices out there clamoring for us to pay heed to what they're speaking. There's the voice that enters into our mind that is based on our emotions and our misunderstanding of who God is. And Lisa helped us to understand that. And we think certain ways. You know, I said it before. He's, he's God the Father. He's not the Godfather. You know, he's Father God, not the Godfather. And a lot of people look at God that way. Like he's just this harsh God that just wants to judge people. He's aloof. He doesn't really care for us. But we got to come to the place where we know who God is. And the only way we're going to truly understand who he is is through his word. Some people say, well, no, no, I know who he is through prayer. I know who he is through worship. To a degree, to an extent, you will know who he is through that. But the reality is, God has chosen to reveal himself to us through his word. And he's made known, he makes known his ways to us, his character, his intentions, his plans, who he really is through his word. So we have to be planted in that good soil, in the soil of the word of God. Satan will speak. Satan will come to you. He came to Jesus and spoke to him. He will come to you, and he'll try to deceive you. Um, The voice of others as well. There are people that will come to you, and they will try to discourage you from doing things that God has called you to do, or they may encourage you to do something God has not called you to do. And the reality is you've got to know the voice of God in every circumstance, in every situation. It's amazing today how many people will make comments like, well, God told me this. And we said, well, what, how did he speak to you? Well, you know, I, I just heard this voice. And they judge and make decisions, significant life decisions based on a dream, based on something that they perceived. So it becomes very subjective. And what happens is if we're not careful, we can literally misunderstand what God is saying to us. Or there are times when it's not even God. It's us, you know. And it can be the devil. Not all dreams are God. Hello. Read Jeremiah 23. He said, there are those who have dreams. He said, yeah, dream your dreams. But the one who has my word, let him speak forth my word, the prophet said. So not every dream is of God. And every dream... And every vision and everything that we experience that is subjective, and I believe in dreams and visions, Acts chapter 2 is clear, must be lined up with the Scripture, with the Word of God. What does the Bible say? We have to make decisions based on the truth of God's Word. Because Satan wants to come, and here's his tactics. He will try to disappoint you. And you know how he he brings, tries to bring disappointment into our lives? To lead us down a pathway that God has not called us to go down. So we get involved in relationships with people that God doesn't want us to walk with. We, We end up going places that God has not called us to go. Or perhaps we lag behind and we don't stay in, a pl- in the pace that God has called us to walk. And what ends up happening is things don't go well in our lives. So we get disappointed. And guess what? 
That's exactly what the enemy's trying to do. He's trying to make you heart sick. Because disappointment will eventually result in demoralization. You, you come to the place where your morale has sunk, where you're demoralized, and now you have no hope. And it can actually bring you to the place where you become discouraged and even deceived. Then you get to the place where you are devastated and then even destroyed if you don't pull out of it quickly. There are people that become so overwhelmed with things and situations in life, even Christians I'm talking about now, who have gone down a pathway God has never called them to go down to. They thought this is God. This or someone else might have spoken to them. They listened. They didn't challenge it with the Word of God. And they ended up going down a pathway that the Bible even says there is a way that seems right to man, but the end thereof is death. It results in destruction. You think it's God, but it's not God. And then it's not, it doesn't work out. Why? Because the blessing of the Lord makes one rich. And he adds no sorrow to it is what it says. The word translated sorrow in Hebrew means painful toil. God doesn't add all this painful toil. If God's called you to do something, he blesses it. You know, God just commands a blessing when we walk in obedience. He opens doors for us. I'm not saying the enemy doesn't try to to hinder. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying when you fully heard from God and then you step out in faith, you know it's God, then it will happen. God will bring it to pass because you're planted on good soil, which is the Word of God. We must know what the Word of the Lord is in order to be able to differentiate between the voice of, the, of God in contrast to what is merely man or even worse, the devil. We have to know what the Word of God says. The Bible says, Matthew 4 verse 4, man does not live by bread alone, which is the earthly, the natural, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And when Jesus said that, he was speaking to Satan, who was speaking to him, trying to lead him astray. And Jesus said that the way we live, the way we overcome, is by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It's in the present tense, meaning that God is always speaking. It literally is rhema. And he's speaking. He's giving us a rhema word. He's talking. He's saying, I want to show you my will. I want to speak to you. I want to show you the way you're supposed to go. I want to answer your questions. And if you're at a crossroads right now and you're just saying, I don't know what to do. What am I supposed to do? The reality is God is saying you need to seek him until you understand. He'll speak his word to you. Get alone with him. Read the word every day. Meditate on it. Speak it forth. And then begin to say, Lord, quicken this to me. Give me a word. Speak to my spirit. Show me exactly what your analysis is, your assessment of this situation is right now. Give me a word because Revelation 19 verse 10 says, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So when you're wondering, what am I supposed to do? You need the testimony of Jesus. And he'll come and he'll speak to you through the spirit of prophecy, which is the Holy Spirit. It will give you a rhema word. It will not contradict the written word. It will coincide with the written word, but it will be God saying, this is the way, walk in it. I want to lead you. I want to guide you, but you've got to plant your roots in the, fo- in the firm foundation of God's word, in the good soil of his word. If you don't read the Word, if you don't spend time in the Word, if you don't meditate on the Word, if you don't confess the Word, of course you're not going to live and walk in victory. Of course, because the Word is food. And in the natural, if you don't eat, what's going to happen? You'll get so weak, so anemic, and eventually you become sick and you can die. So if you're not in the Word of God, you're not going to be able to overcome. So many Christians, look, I've been doing this over 30 years, guys, and let me tell you, I've talked to people from everywhere. God told me this, God told me that, and I'm like, so how's that working? Well, that was 20 years ago, and nothing's happened. Right. So that was God, was it? Yeah. See, listen, the fact is, God is not like them. When God speaks a word to you, He'll bring it to pass. He's faithful. He's not a liar. He'll bring it to pass. Now, do we have to do our part? Yes. We have to obey the word. If all we do is hear him and we don't apply it to our lives, of course, 
nothing's going to come to pass. But when God speaks and then we begin to move, then it will come to pass. He will do what we cannot do. He will add his super to our natural. And he will cause us to be able to shift into that place where we see the miracles of God come to place in our life. So we have to be rooted and grounded in the Word of God. Secondly, we need to be planted in deep soil. Not only good soil, but deep soil. I want to read just a passage to you. It's found in Jeremiah 29. It says this, verse 11, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They're plans for good not for disaster, to give you a future and hope. Did you hear that? Now, let's look at the context. Israel, Judah, was in captivity in Babylon. God is saying, after 70 years, I'm going to restore you. I'm going to bring you back to your homeland. And he says, I know the plans I have for you. I'm a good God. I'm a good father. I'm not, going, I'm not out to destroy your life. I'm not out to make life difficult or mess you up. I actually want to bless you, to give you a future and a hope. Listen to this. Then verse 12. In those days when you pray, I will listen. And he says, if you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. I will be found by you, says the Lord. I will end your captivity and restore your fortunes. Another translation says, you will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all of your heart. So what is God saying? God is saying to the people who are in Judah, it is imperative that you understand the revelation of who I am because if you don't know me as a good God, if you don't perceive me as the Father who wants to bless your life, you will literally become embittered with me saying, why are you bringing, why have you brought this hardship and difficulty into my life? So I'm going to reiterate it I know the plans I have for you. Plans to bless you. Plans to prosper you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. And then God says, now, this is who I am, and this is what I want to do. I want to end your captivity and restore your fortunes. Come and seek me. Come and seek me. This is who I am. Come and seek me. I want to do it for you, but come and seek me. Go deeper. It's not enough for you just to say, oh yeah, I've got the word of the Lord. Now we have to seek the Lord till he brings it to pass. Just like Elijah, when he had the word of the Lord that God was going to send rain, and then he ascended to the top of Mount Carmel, and he began to seek God, and he prayed seven times until God brought the word to pass. And this is literally the the defining mark that literally sees some people slag behind and never experience breakthrough and others cross that line and shift into that place where they experience the, the return from captivity and the restoration of all of the blessings of God upon their life. Because they're paying the price. They're not going to be lethargic or lazy or complacent. They're not going to become embittered with God and say, God, why is it that you're allowing me to go through this? But they're going to seek God until they understand that God is saying, when you seek me, you will find me. When you search for me with all of your heart. How much do we seek God with in terms of our heart? How much are we really pursuing God with? God said, seek me with all of your heart. Isaiah 45, 15. Truly, you are a God who has been hiding himself. Isaiah 45, 15. You're a God who's been hiding himself. Isn't that something? They're saying, God, if you read the context, he's saying, I command you to seek me, but I'm not telling you to seek me in vain. A lot of people think, say, I've tried. I sought God. I prayed. But guess what? You didn't seek Him with all your heart. You didn't seek Him until you experienced the breakthrough. You became weary in your seeking. Maybe you became bitter in your seeking. Perhaps you just kind of looked at the situation and the circumstance that you're going through and you just said, God, it's not fair. Why are you making me have to do this? Why can't you just give it to me on a gold platter? And God's saying, because I need to prepare you for the blessing. I need to increase your ability to be able to carry what I want to give to you. So, I'm not going to give you the promise apart from the preparation process. 
I'm going to do a work in your life that causes you to seek after me so that you realize who I am and what I want to do in your life. And Western Christianity, for the most part, has become a lazy, egotistic pursuit of the blessings of God, the material things of God, rather than seeking God himself. And we don't spend a lot of time in the Word. We don't spend a lot of time praying. One of the churches in the Philippines has a prayer meeting. It starts at 7 o'clock at night. The whole church rocks up, and they pray nonstop until 6 o'clock in the morning once a month. Guess what's happened to the church? It's exploded. The church has been around a few months, and they've already got 500 people. In a Muslim area. Because there's a people that are saying, we desperately need God. What we know. See, see, the Bible says, you know what? People talk about, oh yeah, I know God, I know God. Oh, come on. The Bible says his ways are unfathomable. He's like a, a, a bottomless ocean, guys. And the more we seek him, the more we pursue him, the more we get to know him, the more we are literally, and we encounter a revelation of how little we know God. There's so much more to know about him. There's so much more to find. God wants us to pursue him. And he says, the people said, God, you're a God who's been hiding himself, the God of, and the Savior of Israel. And listen to me. God is saying, yeah, yeah, I've been hiding myself, but I'm not hiding from you. I'm hiding for you. You know when you play hide and seek with children, right? I mean, you're not, you, you're not literally, you don't want them to not find you. I mean, if you didn't want your kids to find you, you know what you do? You get in a car and you drive a thousand miles away, blindfold them, I don't know, tie them to their bed or something, and, you know, and, and if you didn't want them to find you. But you obviously, parents, you do want your kids to find you. So you're not hiding from them, you're hiding for them. And, and so there's a sense in which I'm not saying that life is a game that is to be taken so trivial, but I'm saying that the reality is God is saying, come and pursue me. Come and follow after me because I want to take you to a deeper place. And see, what happens is in our desperation, we can become bitter and turn away from God or we can become emboldened and pursue him. And so the scripture says, Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8, Blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. They're like trees planted along a riverbank with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. So God says this, I've called you to pursue me. I've called you to seek me. I've called you in this time of what seems as drought, what seems as famine, he said, you can have a revelation. And this is what happens. There are two different types of people in the world. There are people that look at their adversity, their hardship, and they go, where's God? I'm in the wilderness. And then there are those who say, yeah, things around me may not be looking good, but I'm not in the wilderness. I'm a tree planted by the river. So I'm here planted by the river, and it says specifically here, one translation says that the tree spreads out its roots. The New Living says, the tree has roots that reach deep. So what happens is in the time of drought, in the time of famine, this tree, the top root of the tree, which interestingly is located directly under the trunk of the sea. It's the tree that is kind of like the artery, the, the, the root that is the artery that is connected directly and brings the greatest flow of life. That particular uh, root, that tap root extends and it tunnels and it literally digs through the earth, almost like it has a sense of smell, knowing where the water is, and it keeps pressing, and it keeps tunneling until it locates the water. And so even in the midst of drought and famine, when all the other trees are drying up, they're not bearing fruit, this particular tree actually sees its opportunity in adversity to go deeper and says, I'm going to press through and I'm going to break through. I'm not going to see my circumstances. How here I am planted in the wilderness. Woe is me. But I'm going to go 
deeper with God, and I'm going to press through, and I'm going to pray through, and I'm going to fast more than I've ever fasted. I'm going to worship more than I've ever worshiped because I'm convinced that He's a good God. His mercy endures forever. He's not trying to destroy me, but He's just calling me to a deeper place that will actually strengthen me and empower me to do greater exploits. So I won't become bitter. I won't become hardened by what is happening. I will allow it to break me and to define me so I become a man, a woman who becomes a pursuer of God because I know I am like a tree planted by the river. Hallelujah. The true seeker of God, for the true seeker of God, adversity actually draws them closer to the Lord. They extend their spiritual roots in quest of the living waters of salvation and deliverance. They persist and they pursue until they break through into abundance. They lack nothing. They remain vital and vibrant in times of hardship. And they bear fruit in all seasons because they are planted in deep soil. Hallelujah. The third area that we're called to be planted in is we're called to be planted in community. We're called to be planted literally in the house of God. Let's look at Psalm chapter 92 for a moment. Psalm 92 verses 12 through 15. It says this, the righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon. Planted in the, where? In the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. They will bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green. And listen to this. Proclaiming, the Lord is upright. He's my rock. And there's no wickedness in him. Again, what happens is God is saying there are people who literally that are planted. And a result of them being planted, what takes place is they stay vibrant. They bear fruit. They possess the promises of God. They're tapped into his life, and they have a revelation of the true character and nature of God. They're not saying, man, God doesn't love me. God doesn't care for me. He doesn't answer me. I'm sick and tired of waiting. Where are you, God? Why am I going through this? They don't do that. They actually say that God is good. God is holy. God is righteous in all his ways. He's upright. He's my rock, and there's no wickedness in him. And what happens is he says specifically, it's those who are planted in the house of the Lord. Now listen to me. The fact is, we have to be planted in the house of the Lord. Planted. Planted. You know what that means? You have roots. You just can't pull up your roots and go away. You have to be planted. And what happens is, sometimes... When God is working in people's hearts and he's trying to challenge them and he's trying to address areas in their life where he's wanting to change, they try to pull up the roots and go somewhere else. And God is never able to finish the work that he's trying to do in their life. It's not those who, who, you know, come periodically. It's not those who just show up once in a while. But it's those who are planted in the house of the Lord. When you're planted in the house of God, God says, I can bless you. Why is it that we need to be planted in the house of the Lord? There are Christians that will tell you, I don't need to be around other Christians. I don't need to go to church. You know what? I've got Facebook and I've got YouTube. That's all I need. And Jesus. And the reality is, there's a problem with that. First of all, there are over 40 commandments in the New Testament that have the two words, one another, in them. And by not fellowshipping, by not being in communion with other people, how are you going to fulfill the commandments that have one another? I'm busy, God knows, I'll rock up once a month or whenever, and God knows what's going on in my life. No, you will never become the person that God has created you to be. You will never experience the full measure of his grace and his transforming work in your life by being withdrawn. The enemy is all about isolation. God is all about community. And the enemy wants us to withdraw. He wants to isolate us. He wants us to to keep us out of fellowship with other people. So we need to be planted in the house of the Lord. I did a little bit of research about oak trees. And do you know the interesting thing about oak trees is most oak trees, their roots are only 18 inches under the soil. However, in terms of depth, they may spread 
and occupy a space four to seven times the width of the tree's crown. Isn't that interesting? So, this is what he's saying. And the interesting thing is the roots literally interact with one another and they literally connect with one another. They fasten themselves to one another and this actually results in them becoming strong. So when the wind blows, when a storm comes, when a fire burns, then what happens is because they're tied to one another, they're tethered to one another, not just individually rooted, then they're able to stand in the midst of all of that hardship. Now let me explain something to you. And I, I, I checked this out by a great Canadian scientist. And this is what it says. Okay, this is what I found out. That a tree, oak trees in a forest, have a very complex root system that interfaces and communicates with the other root system of trees. Contrary to what Darwin taught, these trees are not really individuals in the sense that they're competing for the survival of the fittest. On the contrary, they are a community that interacts with each other with the goal of helping each other survive. Through the connected root system, what actually takes place is carbon and nitrogen is disseminated and distributed to whatever tree needs it at a given time. Now, the other interesting thing about the, uh, the, the community that, that is forged literally in this forest is it's the diversity that causes them community to become resilient. Sometimes we say, well, you know, I, I just can't relate to that person. They're just not like me. Well, thank God they're not like you. We don't need another one of you. You don't need another one of me. So the reality is, God's saying it's the diversity which literally causes the resilience. Because we're just individual parts of the body. We're not the whole body. As anointed and as gifted as some people are, they're just a member. They're just a segment. They're just a piece of the anatomy. And that's all they are. And God is saying we need one another. And so it's our diversity that creates the resilience. So when you see someone that maybe is different than you, celebrate that difference. Because God has created them for a certain way. I'm not talking about people that, you know, have, have sin issues and are just nasty, mean people. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people that literally are just different. Your personality is different. Your gifts are different. The way you think is different. You, and you, the way you express yourself is different. God has created us for diversity in community, and it results in resilience. We need one another. Here's something else that I found out about the forest or, or the trees that are connected together. In each one of these networks, so to speak, there is what is called a mother or parent tree. There is a mother or parent tree. Typically, that mother tree is the oldest tree. It's the most dominant tree in the forest. And what ends up taking place is that mother tree literally is the source of the sustenance. It literally feeds and literally supports all the other trees. So sometimes what ends up happening, can I just say this the way it is? We have a younger generation that thinks they don't need the older generation. They think I'm good, I'm okay, you know what? But the fact is you need a mother tree. You need a mama, you need a papa, you need someone who will be a spiritual elder to you. Because the fact is they literally are the ones that God has called upon to bring the impartation and the dissemination of the grace of God. And there's things that we need to learn from them. Here's what happens often in our, in our modern day practices of forestry. What ends up happening is when the mother tree is dying, modern forest practices, it's to cut it down. But the problem is we have failed to allow the tree to pass on its legacy to the new generation. We cut down the tree when it's dying to make timber, but we actually have aborted the, the process of this tree giving back to the community. You know why? Because these dying trees actually in their final out, uh, weeks and uh, months of living actually move resources to the newer trees. The younger ones coming before them before they completely collapse. 
So the interesting thing is we just cut it down when we see it dying rather than allow it to remain for a while and we literally cut off the flow of these resources that are about to be dispersed and disseminated into these younger trees. So in effect, it's a transfer, a passing of the baton, so to speak, from one generation to the next. Can you think? That's amazing, isn't it? Here's this tree. It looks like it's dying. And we I'll cut it down. And God says, that's the way we treat people, is it? And I want to say to you, if you're here today, and you're in your older years of life, in your senior years of life, There's a lot of stuff that you have in you that still needs to be passed on to the next generation. We don't want to cut you down. We want to encourage you to step up and realize what you have in you. Say, well, my best days are gone. Not at all. God's saying there's a final impartation that you can give to this generation. And you will literally cause the resources that God has put inside you to be passed on to the next generation. And that generation literally needs those resources in order to survive. The fact is when, they, when we cut down trees before they've actually died, what ends up taking place is we literally hinder the health and the, the spiritual growth, the, the growth of the whole forest. Because the final infusion of life And the resources that are in the mother tree are not able to be disseminated and imparted into the tree. We need one another. The younger needs the older. The older needs the younger. We need one another. We're called to be planted in the house of the Lord. Do you know what Satan, I believe, fights against the most? is simply people going to a godly church. He'll do whatever he can to try to discourage you. You know? I mean, God, we do things too, right? Like we stay up till 4 o'clock in the morning and then go, oh man, I'm so tired. I don't know why I can't go to church. I don't feel like it. Uh, rocket scientists, come on. Uh, the fact is, we realize that we do things that we literally shouldn't do that result in us not being able to receive. But the fact is, we're called to community. Not a single one of us is called to walk alone. The enemy is all about isolation. He's about keeping us out of fellowship. Because in that place, we will receive an impartation of grace in that place of community. So I want to just say in closing this morning that God has called us to literally be a people that know the power of being planted. Planted in good soil, planted in deep soil, planted in community, planted in the house of God. As you do that, I'm telling you, you're going to see God keep you strong and move in your life, and you're going to become the person God has created you to be. When things get difficult, don't run away. When things get heated, don't run away. When you begin to be challenged by the Word of God, don't get angry. Submit and say, God, yes, you're speaking to me. It's your Word. I need to align myself to the truth of your Word. Can we stand together? I want to just pray. And then we'll let you go home. The power of a planted life. The power of a planted life. This word's going to stick with you guys. It's going to stick with you. I know it is. The Holy Spirit told me it's going to really stick. It's a sticky word. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your love, Jesus. Thank you that you've called us to yourself, to your word, To be rooted and grounded in the good soil of your word. To be rooted and grounded in deeper soil, Father. In times of difficulty. We recognize you've not abandoned us in the wilderness. But you've planted us on the riverbank. And Father, we know that as we go deeper with you, we're going to find what we need. You're not, you haven't forsaken us. You haven't left us. You're with us. So we thank you for that. And thank you, Lord, for the power of community. Thank you, Lord, for spiritual mothers and fathers that you put into our lives. Thank you for brothers and sisters that you brought around us because we are connected. We're part of a network, so to speak. We're part of a community that cares for one another, that literally interfaces and interacts and brings all the grace that is needed to strengthen the weak, to help the person who's downcast, who's struggling. And Father, we just thank you that in our times of difficulty, you told us not to withdraw, Not to shrink back, but to press in. Not just to you, but to press into community. To call out to others who will be there for us, to help us and support us. 
And we thank you, Lord, that you put us in a family, a family of grace, a family, Lord, that will cause us to be able to become more like Jesus in all our ways. So we thank you for your grace on our lives, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen.